let's uh let's get started let's start drinking some wine y'all um today we're in hungary which is really cool because we weren't gonna do hungary and then allison was insistent and she's like i really think that people would enjoy hungary and i thought no one's gonna buy this sweet wine bundle and every single person did so thank you all for proving me wrong. I love it when people do that. I'm not kidding. That's literally one of my favorite things. Um, I'm just really jazzed because I do love sweet wine. This Tokai is fantastic. Um, but I understand having worked in the wine industry now for the last 15 years, um, a lot of people are really hesitant to drink it. They don't like it. They don't understand it. Why is it so cloyingly sweet? And it's just really cool to be able to bring you a wine that kind of bashes all of those really awful reputations that sweet wine has. Um, it's not cloyingly sweet. And we're going to tell you why this is a good example. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that, then I brought the wrong glass. I went for the tiny glass. <laughs> no, 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 no. Normal glass so you can swirl. <laughs> I thought sweet. I don't think I can do it. You can do it, I promise. I think we could very easily get through these bottles together. <laughs> and I'll explain this later, but this is this is not a five petunios. The this is if we had a five petunios Tokai, you would want a spoon. Like honey. We are not there. We are we are way back on the scale of sweetness that's available in uh Hungary. Yeah, so we're jumping ahead. We'll get to all that. Allison will explain what a petunios is. And we'll, we'll get into that later. But um, I first just wanted to say thank you guys all so much for participating in this five-part series. It was a huge learning experience for me. It was really, really cool to be able to experience these unique wines with all of you guys. Um, I'll let Mike and Allison speak for themselves, but this was just such a trip and I'm literally, pun intended, and um, I'm just I'm just thrilled and it's really exciting. Um, we'll talk about this at the end, but we are definitely planning um, that Pinot comparative tasting that everyone has requested. So we've got that, that we can um, launch to you guys later. And then we are also planning our Southern hemisphere tasting as well. So uh, just because COVID seems to be coming to an end, we promise to continue traveling with you around the world. And then maybe when travel recommend or when travel gets a little bit easier we can all plan a actual trip somewhere we can do some kind of I don't know local or I would love to go into Europe actually to some of these wine regions as well so we've got lots of exciting stuff on the horizon and just thank you all so much for joining um and this is the last one we're in Hungary so last week we were in Georgia uh the current flight time from Georgia to Hungary is just over three hours we're fresh, we're ready to go, we're ready to taste some wine per usual. Don't wait for us to start talking about these delicious wines. I normally say it doesn't matter which direction you go in between the two, although because we are going from a nice high acid wine to a sweeter uh, delicious wine, I would probably enjoy the higher acid um, normal white wine first and then maybe just keep the sweet wine to the end. That's goes against what I normally say, but that's my my recommendation. You don't have to follow it. It's not a rule, just a recommendation this time. Um, and then uh, before we officially get started, let's do our normal cheers. Um, today in Hungarian, we are saying cheers, and this is a hard one. This is probably one of the hardest ones we've had. Um, let me throw it in the chat. I'll do, uh, <laughs> you're gonna laugh at the spelling. I I how do you say it? It's like year or something. I got you guys. I promise. <laughs> um, I'm just trying. Oh crap! I'm trying to find my. Ooh. Please pause. Please hold. Where did my chat go? It's like I've never done this before. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so it's a hard one. Oh, it's okay. it's pronounced Eggy Shigidra, which is probably Eggy wrong, Shigidra. but I've listened to the YouTube tutorial like 50 times. So cheers everyone. Eggy Shigidra. Eggy Shigidra. Eggy Shigidra. Oh, Eggy Shigidra. Lots of eggs. Eggs to everyone. 
So the one in the email guy, guy room, that's let's go. Yeah. That's yeah. the one I was in. Oh, that was, oh, I'm learning <laughs> today. It's like you've never received an email from me, Mike. <laughs> I open it up and it says guy room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right, guys. Well, enjoy your first sip per usual. I'm going to give you some silly fun facts about Hungary and then we're going to change up the um, the format just a little bit. I'm going to be the one giving the wine history and then Allison is going to go into the actual uh, information on ferment, which is the grape for both of the wines tonight. We've got the dry version and the sweet version. Um, and then Mike will finish us off with the fantastic uh, tasting notes and food pairings. So if you're all ready, um, fun fact number one, the Rubik's Cube was invented by hu the Hungarian architect Erno Rubik in 1974. Hungarians have their own cowboys. Think about an American cowboy with the hat and the horses and everything. They've got that too. Um, they're called Cisco's in Hungarian and they live and entertain their visitors with amazing horse shows on the Hungarian Great Plain, which is called the Putzta. Um, Hungary, or I'm sorry, the country is located between the 46th and the 49th parallel, which is actually the same latitude range as many of, as many of France's top wine regions from the Northern Rhone to Champagne. And the Hungarian language is known as Magyar and is the direct descendant of the language spoken by the Huns. Um, it is not an Indo-European language and only has two related languages in Europe, which are Finnish and Estonian. Um, anytime I think about the Huns, I think of the movie Mulan and that let's get down to business song pops into my head. <laughs> Sorry, we can sing along later. Um, and <laughs> the month I... What? Same. Absolutely okay. same. <laughs> Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> Uh, the mummified right hand of the first king of Hungary can be seen at St. Stephen Basilica, which is in Budapest. And uh, the, so the, it's the hand of King Stephen. Um, that was, his body was exhumed and they found that the right hand was still in really good condition. The hand was later stolen and buried by a cleric who was supposed to guard it. Later, it was recovered and transported around Europe till Queen Maria Theresa purchased it and gave it back to Hungary. You go, girl. And then finally, to answer our question, how old is old, old? Uh, Hungary is one of the oldest countries in Europe. It was founded in 897 and is older than France, Germany, and England. So everyone, welcome to Hungary. Um, okay, I'm yeah, cheers to that. Um, I'm just gonna pop right in. I promise not to bore you too much, although all of this wine, if this, this wine is relevant, all of the information is relevant. Um, a brief history on Hungary. Uh, Hungary's wine region, it predates the Roman Empire, and at the time, Hungary was one of the most important wine regions in Europe. It's not necessarily the case anymore, although we are bouncing back. Uh, the wines of Tokai, uh, were first mentioned in the late 1400s and were consumed by royalty, emperors, popes, and czars for more than 300 years. Uh, sadly, the Hungarian wine rule came to an end because of many factors. Um, first, the phylloxera plague in the 1880s, two world wars, and 40 years of communi communist collectivization. Uh, during those world wars, Vineyards were neglected and destroyed and the country's entire landscape was changed by the Austro-Hungarian state, which was dissolved in 1918. Uh, collectivization, which I mentioned earlier, that um, is when the, all the peasants were forced to give up their small individual plots of land and um, turn them into large collective farms. Hello, Aaron, welcome. Um, <laughs> and so that happened in the 1950s. And so that just immediately ruined any chance for any small producer to produce their own thing. All of the grapes were then going into uh, exactly what the communists wanted, which was bulk mass produced wine, which of course is not as delicious um, as small produced wine or small batch wine. 
And then it wasn't until uh, the 1990s after the fall of communism that the wine industry finally began to bounce back and modernize. So today, Hungary is finally making its comeback and the small estates have been replanted and cultivated across the country and are finally producing beautiful wines like the ones we have here tonight. And most of the country's vineyards are considered to be cool climate and the winemakers today infuse traditional winemaking techniques uh, into their modern wineries. So there is always just a touch of history in um, what these winemakers are doing. Hungary has now 22 wine regions and 156,000 acres of planted vines, which grow hundreds of wine varieties. And finally, Hungary is rich in volcanic soils and limestone idyllic soil types, which are perfect for winemaking. Um, next up, we've got, I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. Uh, Hungary has four primary regions. Hold please. Here we go. So this, these major regions are kind of broken down into the smaller regions. So this map's just slightly harder to read. Uh, but basically the, the most important one that we're gonna be talking about tonight is this purple region up here. Um, and I will go into the other four uh, primary regions as well. Those are Eger, which is in the north. That is right here, this blue guy. Um, Villainy, which is at the southernmost tip of Hungary, which is, let's see if I can find it. This is a very detailed map. It's down there somewhere. Uh, Nagi Slomo, which is the smallest wine region. Obviously, we're not finding that on this map. And then Tokai, like I mentioned, is in that purple region right there. Um, so a little bit about these regions. Um, Eger is uh, known for the grapes that there's a lot of natively grown grapes there. And scientists actually identified a 30 million year old wine grape fossil uh, among the modern day vineyards. And so that's obviously a very old wine region. Villainy, um, 140 miles south of Budapest near Hungary's border with Croatia and um, only 340 miles from the Adriatic Sea. Nagy Slomo, like I said, is the smallest wine region, um, but is extremely fascinating. Uh, they have really specific terroir that makes some of the smokiest, most fiery white wines of the world. Um, the bedrock is black basalt, uh, which is reminiscent of ancient lava flows. And on top of that, the topsoil is made up of lowest clay and sand. Um, so I'd love to get my hands on some of that. Um, there's a lot of history of different like legends around this area. One of the, the funniest ones that I've come across is that aristocrats and monarchs sent fertile women there to drink that wine, believing that the wine's overpowering masculinity would lead them to beget a male heir. Cool. Men are still today much more important than women. Um, I'm joking. And then finally, Tokai, which is the star for this evening. Tokai is a region in Northeast Hungary and is today the gold standard of the Hungarian wine regions. Um, it is without a doubt the most famous wine region in all of Hungary and is the oldest classified wine region in the world um, the, with the first vineyard classification in 1700, more than 150 years before the Bordeaux classification of 1855. And of course, per usual, it is uh, one of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites as well. And if anyone is looking at the um, bottle that says Tokai, it's spelled T-O-K-A-J-I and it's spelled, it's pronounced toe, like your toe on the foot, Kai. So Tokai is what we're drinking this evening. Um, and then more specifically, uh, this wine region um, was named after the village of Tokai, which is not spelled T-O-K-A-J-I, it's, it's spelled T-O-K-A-J, still pronounced the same. Um, and it's made up of 28 towns scattered along rolling hills and between two rivers. And those rivers create a special microclimate, um, which increase very high levels of moisture in the air. Um, which 
are thankfully offset by the wind and sunshine. So mold doesn't happen on the vines because that's always so not. good. Good mold happens. Yes, the good mold, but not the bad mold. There's right. there's a difference. There's a big difference. You don't want the bad mold. Um, yeah, exactly. So Allison, I'm sure we'll get into that as well. Um, so that's the wine history for everyone. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Allison, would you like to tell us about the winery? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to start first with the grape and tell you a little bit about ferment because it is one of the most important grape varieties in Hungary. Uh, if you have heard of it, you likely know that it's one of the primary varieties used in Tokai Azu dessert wines. But if you've not heard about it, now's the time to know about it. Because I really do believe, and I recently wrote about this, that it is time for ferment to assume its rightful place in line with the best wine grapes um, in the world. So when I say the best wine grapes, um, Chardonnay, Riesling, um, I think that this grape should be up there because from dry crisp wine to a sweet wine, this is Hungary's flagship grape. So the first mention of ferment was in reference to an ecclesiastical document in 1611. And then again, in the mid 19th century, it was identified as one of the top three most widespread cultivars of 63 grape varieties in use at the time. And what that means is this grape ferment is the mommy or daddy to 63 other grapes that were planted in Hungary. Um, in the 1880s, after the phylloxera damaged the vines, they had, they had replanted with ferment, and that's when it really became the dominant grape variety. So there's a, the heritage of ferment has, has a lot of myths, and there are a lot of stories that it came from abroad. Some people said it came from Italy. It was thought that maybe missionaries or colonists or soldiers or kings brought it over, um, also from Italy. But the truth is that ferment is the result of a natural genetic cross between Gouet Blanc, which is an ancient variety, and an unknown, most likely extinct um, local variety. So with the genetic link to Gouet Blanc, do you know who ferment is half siblings with? It's half siblings with Chardonnay, Gamay, and Riesling. So, you know, maybe that fits up there with why I said it should be in the same, uh, lauded the same way. So today, 90% of the plantings in Tokai are to ferment. And there are more than 10,000 acres of ferment planted. And there are small amounts that have spread to other parts of Hungary, as well as neighboring countries. Uh, in Austria, they call ferment Mosler. In Germany, it's also called Mosler. In Slovenia and Northern Croatia, it's called Shipone or it's Sipone, it's S with a, with a little U above it. Um, Croatia also calls it Moslavic Bijeli and Transful Transylvania calls it Som. So, I mean, there you go. I guess Transylvania is another old, old, old world we could hit sometime, Gina. <laughs> but, so even though it's not the, yeah, even though it's not the most planted grape variety, it is the most important grape. And it occupies in the Tokai region, the primary region that Gina had spoken about, it occupies two thirds of the total vineyard area. Sweet Tokai was extremely popular in the time of the Austria-Hungarian Empire in the late 1600s to early 1700s, uh, sorry, late 1800s to the early 1900s. And the you know, the, the growth of, vine of ferment vineyards has, has grown steadily over time. And it can still be found in, um, like I said, some of these other countries. So um, one of the things about ferment is that it can go from a light pale color and to light amber. It can have aromas of pineapple, lemon blossom, orange rind, ripe pear, white peach, yellow peach, and apricot but it's a variety that's known for picking up the distinctive minerality of Tokai soil, and it beautifully expresses the terroir, which it is really adapted to over many centuries. So ripe unbotricized grapes are used to produce the dry version, but, um, and I'll, I'll 
tell you a little bit about the sweeter version, the really sweet that we're not doing before we get tasting. But ripe, um, the thing about ferment, it's a really thin skin grape. So it's really susceptible to botrytis, which is noble rot. And it also has high acidity. So that makes it the perfect combination to make a sweet wine. So if the bot if the botricized grapes find their way into the fermentation tanks when you're making a dry wine, like the first one we're gonna have, it actually adds another layer of interest and complexity. And you might get sense of honeycomb or jasmine. So it could happen. So what makes ferment really special is its lovely acidity, its lengthy texture. And if you do it the right way, it has a silky texture. It has the potential to age and it has a great potential not seen with other indigenous varieties in Hungary. So I think I've made my case why I think it's one of the greatest white wines of the world. Um, but before we taste, you should know about one of the wineries that has really um, helped bring it into the market here in the US. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of Vega Cecilia, but Vega Cecilia is uh, one of the most famous uh, Spanish families. The um, they are the people famous for making uh, Vega Sicilia and Ribera del Duero. They also have Bordeaux's Co uh, de Estranal. So they are um, a very, very important family. And after parcels of land were returned to their second pre-World War owners in vineyards, when local winemakers and outside investors were allowed to come in, Ribera uh, del Duero's Vega Cecilia, sorry, and Bordeaux's Code de Estornal came in. I'm sorry, they, I misspoke there. So you had two really important families, one from France and one from Spain, coming into Hungary to imp not impose, but share their technology and their knowledge and their uh, attention to detail in a region that had really been um, destroyed by communism and, and other uh, issues that Gina had mentioned. So Bodega Vega Cecilia was founded in 1864 by a Bordeaux trained Spanish winemaker. And he had returned to France from France with cuttings of Bordeaux varieties, which he planted. He planted Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Malbec alongside with Tinto Fino, otherwise known as Tempranillo. Um, the indigenous variety and other indigenous varieties of the region. And this is the wine that brought international acclaim to Ribera del Duero for the first time because they won the 1929 World's Fair in Barcelona. So they were on the map. So in 1982, the Alvarez family, which is only the fourth family to own Vega Cecilia, purchased the estate and their reputation grew globally and they make now one of the most coveted wines in the world. They also then own 120 acres, hectares of vineyards in Hungary, where they use the label Oremus, and that's the wine we have tonight. These vineyards were purchased in 1993, and they spent 25 years recuperating the vines. They replanted them, they rebuilt the caves, and now they can look back and see the results of their hard work. And Gina, I don't know if I had sent you a photo. Do you have that photo of the overview of the property? Yep, I will bring that up right now. So what they really did is they took time to bring the Spanish philosophy of using no pesticides, using organic material, uh, the information they had on clonal selection, and then use the heritage of the old vines. So this is um, Oremus down sort of in the bottom part of the picture. And these are the beautiful hillsides. And this is the vineyards at Oremus are mostly on hillsides that rise steeply above the village of Tolksva in the heart of Tokai of the Tokai Appalachian. They're really close to the Bodrog River, so they benefit for, from you know, particular climatic conditions that uh, perpetuate noble rot or botrytis. All the vineyards at Oremus are classified as first growth. And this is according to the historic Sismere uh, uh, classification of 1803. And the cellars themselves are found under the village of Toxla in a labyrinth of hand-hewn cellars that date back to the 12th century. Ferment was always made traditionally as a sweet wine, but Andras Bosco, the former 
general manager and head winemaker from 1993 until just this January. He recently retired and his son has now taken over the technical side, was convinced that a great white wine, a great still wine could be produced from Tokai. And since Andres loved to travel and because he's a huge fan of Burgundy and Alsace, he started to play with different varieties in Hungary, which included Muscat, but he found that the wine that made that had the most potential to make a great dry wine was ferment. So let's uh, drink the first wine, um, the Ormus Dry Ferment. Ormus pioneered the vinification of high quality oak aged dry wine in the region, primarily with ferment. It's fresh, crisp wine. It's, well, I won't go into too many details of it, but it should be a fresh, crisp wine that is really versatile with a lot of food. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I wish I had a lobster roll in front of me right now. I think that might be the perfect pairing. It is, there is actually a little, I think earlier Alice and I were talking about this and I said that I thought there was like a coconutty suntan oil thing, but I think more precisely it's probably some vanilla from the new oak, right? And I, had, yeah, I have that in my notes. Hmm? Very gently in there. Yes, exactly. It's subtle. It's not, it's not like a California charter. It's overbearing and over the top sometimes, but it's really pleasant and very inviting. And I think I, the main things, this one's kind of complex. So there's tons of things. The more you dive into it, the more you can smell. But I get like lemon curd, kind of uh, like a lemon yogurty sort of thing. And I get dried pineapple. And as Allison and I also were talking about, there's tons of minerality, tons of whetstone on the nose and on the palate. I think this might be a super textbook example of a wine loaded with minerality on the nose and the palate. So if you're ever, you know, kind of confused by that term or like wonder, like, I think in, to me, it actually reminds me a little on the nose. I think somebody might be tricked into thinking it was like Premier Cru Chablis on the nose. It has that sort of very intriguing whetstone and also just that overriding kind of dried pineapple and and lemon curd which is not really should be specific um but not necessarily off target um and then on the palate i think it is it, it's not particularly fruity on the nose but on the palate it becomes even more just completely bone dry very high acid absolutely needs food um however it is very intriguing sort of tart green apple, a little bit on the bitter side, but all of that's in balance with sort of the bracing acidity. And there's again, lemon on the, on the palate as well. So I'm wondering if anybody else has any other things to mention that they're getting on this wine. Well, I would, I would add that, you know, it's a really fresh and crisp wine but what's appealing to me on this wine is more the mid palate. It's got this really nice texture that kind of sits there and lingers. And, you know, there's a, whenever you ask, whenever someone describes a wine as minerality or stone fruit, I mean, I think this wine is a great um, example of what that means of feeling on the palate. That kind of, like, I feel like I'm tasting wet rocks and, <laughs> and you're loving it with, with lemon squeezed over it yes and 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 for some reason that's amazing normally people hear that and they're like oh well that sounds terrible but it's it's something only wine people tend to get and the more you drink wines like this I actually think it's this was also debated I think it has oxidative qualities not oxidized because that's a different thing a wine that's oxidized probably a bad wine but oxidative qualities similar to you'd find in white Rioja or the Jura, like a Sauvignon from the Jura, this, I would probably mistake this for that if I had it blind. That's where I would have went with it. Um, but again, not everything's super balanced on this particular ferment, which is fantastic. I mean, that I think would be the overarching thing. It's not a, it's not a sweet wine. It's very dry, very food driven. And I think, I'm curious what people are pairing with it. I saw this amazing, Somebody, Kathy's eating right now. Yeah, Kathy, you got to unmute and tell us what you ended up making. <laughs> we made the chicken paprikash. Oh, yes, oh, I was hoping wow. someone would. Is it good? 
Oh my Very gosh. good. Yes. Well, That's I shouldn't my... eat it, but let me let Paul and William. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> it, it pairs with the wine so beautifully. Nice. Yeah. For anyone who didn't make it, it's a chicken dish that like paprika is like the main ingredient in. And I was reading the recipe and I'm just like drooling over it. And I didn't have time to make it tonight, but that is on the weekend menu for me as well. What's what's the movie? Uh, pepper on your paprikash? It's when Harry met Sally. Yeah. There's too much pepper on my paprikash. Yeah, and make I me never think of grandma. They were talking about paprikash and now I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I think that this is such a beautiful wine that it can, I would have this with sushi. I would have this with oysters. I would have this with a lobster roll. Um, I'm gonna have some grilled salmon for dinner tonight. I think this will pair beautifully. I think it will go with Asian food, something with nice spice. Yeah. It, something with a nice spice in it, not something with the, the spice that is out of balance, you know? So something Thai food. Um, there's a blindness, there's a blindness on the Yeah, sorry, I heard too. Go ahead, go ahead. I was, just, I was just saying, as Kathy and not in screen, uh, <laughs> I was just saying any of those warming spices, not the upfront like capsium spice, like let me clear your sinuses, make you feel like you're gonna cry and sweat at the same time, but <laughs> that that spice that just, you know, irradiates from when you've yeah. had it. In fact, the the more capsium those, those other spices are more for the next wine and wines more in that vein, but that you're, you're spot on with what that goes with. And um, I just think like, this is a very versatile food friendly wine. I, I wanted to say with the oysters, Chablis, I think is a classic pairing for oysters, champagne obviously as well, but Chablis, I always go with the Chablis with oysters, but this might be better because it has more brininess on the palate. So you're just really going, they'd be lifting each other, I think. So I'm curious, I don't know if Sabrina's, I don't know if Sabrina's listening in. I know she's, I mean, she's listening in. I know she's here, but I don't know. She always has good food pairings. So we hopefully- We want we'll... Sabrina. <laughs> Sabrina, Sabrina. <laughs> so while hopefully she- waiting, While we're waiting for her, I was recently oh, in Denver. Oh, oh wait. No, here she voice, comes. A voice I... in the dark. <laughs> oh, I actually, I just had a salad with, um, you know, chicken, marinated chicken, and um, it was really simple. <laughs> Did it work? But I have grilled pineapple for the next. Oh, oh but, but did it work with a salad and grilled chicken? Oh, yes, very much so. I, I mean, I, I think that just shows how versatile, like, um, you know, even having it with, yeah, chicken and a salad, like, why not? I had um, recently, I, of course it wasn't, I didn't have this wine with me, but this wine makes me think a lot about, I had an oyster dish. It was just the most beautiful, simple, like oyster with its own brine with like the smallest little fleck of fresh dill. I had that at a restaurant in Denver a couple weeks ago and the dill like blew my mind. Normally I'm like all the horseradish or all the like, lemon juice or everything and it was just so simple and just like that fleck of fresh dill was so good it was one of the best oysters i've ever had and like i want to go back specifically with this wine because oh, pair yeah. perfectly <laughs> it's funny drinking the wine i'm like oh yeah i have all those hard cheeses in the <laughs> fridge <laughs> yeah there you I mean, go that i would cool. even have this with um cheese i mean i just think it can go with so much i mean it just is it's why it should be one of the great wines of the world i'm telling you <laughs> it is it is quite good gina i just have to tell you uh you were describing all of that like fresh cracked pepper on oysters and kim and i are eating cheese sticks from the kids oh you fancy and it pairs quite nicely so <laughs> cheese sticks and all. It's a very versatile wine. That's, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, I want everyone to keep drinking that. I want to tell you a little bit about the very famous Tokaya Zoo before we jump into our, it'll kind of lead us into what we have next, but keep drinking your, your dry wine and enjoy it. Um, so Tokaya Zoo, a zoo, which is A-S-Z-U with an accent on it, means dried. 
And it's very painstaking to make it. Like Champagne, like Madeira, like Port, like Sherry, they are very intricate processes to make. So the berries require humidity, heat, wind, and rain. Four things you don't always think you want with wine, with growing berries, but they want this to create botrytis. And what botrytis does is it concentrates the sugars and the acidity and creates new flavors. And when you look at a botrytis, did I send you a picture of botrytis? Uh -huh, see, I remember, I was good. This is botrytis right here. They look like little raisins. This is not bad rot, it's called noble rot. Um, and now you got these little raisins and what it's done is it's taken those berries and it just shrunk down. So all that's left is sugar, intense sugar. So the berries are then picked individually, individually. Now, who has seen the how to make rosé by Drew Barrymore? I sent it in an email a couple right. of weeks ago. If you okay. guys remember, Drew Barrymore explained in a video that to make rosé, you have to peel each grape. And she's very, 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 very mistaken. <laughs> but to make Tokai a zoo, you have to pick each grape individually. Not peel it, just pick. So um, so they, they pick them individually and only the best berries are desired. So one person will pick only 22 pounds per day. Most times you talk to people about pickers, they're picking tons by tons. Okay. So to make one kilogram of azu berries, it will take up to five kilograms of healthy grapes. So the azu berries are then macerated with the base wine for 48 hours. And the ratio of base wine, which is uh, a still, uh, you know, a, a regular wine of ferment to azu berries dictates the level of sweetness. And then the blend is paced in old casks and it will ferment for anywhere from three to six months. And then the wines are aged for another minimum of two years before the final blending and bottling. So you have azu wines that can re range from one petunios to six petunios. And petunios, um, Traditionally, this is the indicated number, the indicated number of petunios, which means 20 kilograms of azu berries added to each 140 kilogram cask of base wine or gonchi. This is not something you have to remember, but just so you understand that the final classification level of one petunio, two petunio, three petunio, four is, um, <laughs> is all based on a technical analysis of sugar levels. So they, there, if you look at a five petunios, it will have 120 to 150 grams of sugar per liter. And a six petunios, the highest level, will have 150 to 180 grams of sugar per liter. And this is controlled by legislation. When you have a six petunios, they literally pour it on a spoon for you. It is unbelievable. But I will say that any producer of a five or six petunia will tell you they're not dessert wines, they're sensory experiences. So they're wines that when you have it that way, have it with foie gras, anything else. I once had the chance to taste nine vintages of um, five petunia wines and it was pretty extraordinary. But that's not what we're having today, but just to give you a sense of what a lot of people think of for Tokai, is this really sweet, varying levels of sweetness. But we're, what we have is a late harvest. And with late harvest, what that means is they pick the grapes so late that about 40 to 50% of the grapes have already succumbed to noble rot. And that kind of gives concentrated in sugars and complexity. And then fermentation lasts for about a month. And then this wine is aged for six to eight months in cask. So there you go, Mike, with that info, what do you taste? Uh, a question came in, how many petunios does this wine have? Uh, it's not a petunio wine. So it's, it's not even one? It's not measured by it, it's a late harvest wine because okay. it's only 45, 40 to 50% Botrytis grapes. And so um, 
And uh, let me see if I can see what the residual sugar is on this, because I I think it's on the bottle. Is it? Uh, oh no, it's not. Oh, I think it's a hundred. I think I read it was a hundred and seven. Um, it's a hundred and seven. If I, I recall correctly. Really, I have a really interesting. Um, I'll share it with everyone right now in the chat. Uh, it's it's too detailed for us to like easily glance at it. But if you want the information, I have a really good infographic on Tokai and the Petunios uh, breakdown. So I'll include that in the chat for anyone if they're interested. Yeah. It uh, says it says fifty seven point five grams per liter residual there you sugar. Go. Oh, where did sugar, I get sugar, I was reading a different sugar, one. sugar at harvest two hundred and eighty seven grams per liter. Yeah, so we're talking. This is far less sugar than what a petunio has, but what you have to remember is even when you're at that highest level, that it's like syrup. There is a, a through line of acidity, like you wouldn't believe. Acidity is the key to all sweet wine. Um, anytime you have residual sugar, you want acidity. <clears throat> and one, and or one, else, it gets or the else, but, term, cloying. Well, a lot of Every times- Cloying, it's never a good term in wine, ever. Cloying exactly. means, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, when you think about it, and this is why I always say, we're drinking dry wines unless we're drinking dessert wines, because- um, if you're drinking a quality wine, it should be dry, fermented dry, which is an imperceptible amount of sugar remains. Um, Allison, that I'm going to interrupt you really quickly. I told everyone to wait until we're ready to drink this wine. Oh, drink. Oh. Drink it? Okay. Drink. For anyone who uh, has it, go. <laughs> I, I no, but you want to have an, but when we have a wine, you know, you cannot, you cannot take all the sugar out of a wine in fermentation, but we can't taste we can't taste any sugar in this first wine. Um, the only time you taste sugar, when you shouldn't, is when you're buying a $5 Merlot or Cabernet or Red Blend at the grocery store. Then they add residual sugar in order to be more appealing. But we are not talking about that kind of crap and we're not talking about cheap dessert wines that don't have acidity. Taste this wine. Tell me if you get the acidity, but you also get the sweetness and if that works for you. While everyone's sipping, I will tell you the first time, a story of the first time I ever had Tokai. It was at a very fancy restaurant in Santa Barbara and um, someone gave me a small little glass and I ended up pounding the entire bottle because it's liquid gold and I got very drunk. So don't do that tonight. Enjoy it. This whole um, I just messaged this, but well Stacey commented that it's 11%. I'll tell you one little trick if you're ever shopping for wine. Anytime you see a wine that has 8, 9, 10, 11% alcohol, it likely has residual sugar in it. The lower the alcohol, the, the more chance of sugar. That doesn't mean that a 12% wine has, there are a lot of really low alcohol produced dry wines, but um, if you look at the bottle of Moscato, if you look at a bottle of Brachetto, they're at five or 8% alcohol. If you look at Riesling, Riesling is somewhere between eight and 11% alcohol for the most part. So that's always like a sign to say, oh, there must be residual sugar. The question is how perceptible is it to you? If you taste a German Riesling that is say 10 or 11% might have a lot of sugar, but the acidity is so searing you will never guess how much sugar there is. You might right. say, oh, it's a little sweet, but it might actually be a lot. The same thing with Madeira. If you ever taste a Madeira, the acidity is so intense that, that it really takes, if the sugar is up here, the acidity makes it seem like it's down here. So and that's, balance. Yeah. that's what's really important about the acid and sugar balance in these wines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the best Rieslings have that and the worst ones do not. <laughs> and it's funny because I think sweet, sweet wine people, I mean, like 95% of people are going to say, I don't like sweet wine. Like, that's just kind of the like answer. I've said it a million times, but then I stopped saying it because every tasting room you've went to where the wine, it may be good wine too, and the winemaker's like, so we decided to have a little fun and we made a port or we made a late harvest Sauvignon butter and then they pour it to you and it's just disgustingly sweet. And you'd like walk out of there like, oh my God, 
I mean, they, they just need to stop doing that. It's like, unless you are like an expert at it, don't just play at it. Like, like do it right. You know, with rosés, it's different. Rosés are easier to make okay, but like a sweet wine needs to be made with tons of acid and have all sorts of stuff going on. And I think this one does that. I think it's interesting on the nose. It has all the fruit the other one sort of hinted at and but just like amplified, turned up to 10 and just tons of passion fruit, guava, tons of tropical fruit. It's like so tropical and beautiful. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of other types of fruit, but mainly for me, it's a tropical bomb. Um, and on the palate, I think it really has that balance. I mean, I like to compare it. I like always think about Riesling when I think when I drink something like this and kind of use that as a watermark, but I don't, I don't think that's quite fair because this is far more viscous, I think, than a lot of like spot lacy or os lacy that I've had. And the alcohol is a bit higher. Usually those will come in sometimes at like six or 7% and they just taste, even good ones sometimes just taste straight up like a viscous sort of apple juice. And this wine doesn't do that. This has much more complexity and depth. There's honey tones, but there, there's just that acid overriding it. Allison is laughing. Mike was laughing at me because we did it. We filmed one of our videos oh, yeah. the wine. And I just your note. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh my God, it's like mashed apricots with honey with a ton of acidity. And I got really excited. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you something. Who likes this wine? Who right. thought they didn't like sweet wines? All right. Who's willing to give a well-made sweet wine a chance? <laughs> a well-made, <laughs> qualify that. I like sweet wines that have been vetted by someone else. Like, okay, no, you'll like this one. Now, now think about this, and this is one example, but this others. You can do a wine like this, and this isn't even, you know, overly sweet. Think about foie gras, think about blue cheese, so savory mm -hmm. foods, mm -hmm. but also think about, Sabrina, how does it work with grilled pineapple? Uh, I like it. It's actually really nice, but <laughs> it's funny you said foie gras, because I literally wrote down, this makes me crave foie gras mousse or a tureen with topped with a jellied or paste of quince, and a little finishing salt. Well done. I'm sorry we can't see your face as you say all that, but. <laughs> like, I want it real bad. If anyone hasn't had quince before, it's this like amazing compacted, I'm not gonna say the word jelly. Oh, I used to make jelly out of it. We, yeah. had, a tr we had a tree in our backyard and I would make quince jelly. Yes, it's so good. There's a Spanish mm. restaurant um, in Santa Barbara that does little um pinchos but like little like tapas style things and they have one that has like quince cubes on it and it's just like i could eat those all day they're so good it's a very old old fruit mm -hmm. they're yeah. not like they're really not. pleasant on their own are they they're very kind of like firm and weird right you have to make them into a jelly i think that's Perfect. right i agree with matt and rigo is give sweet wine a chance i absolutely love you know, at the end of a meal, some people will have dessert. And if you don't want dessert, you might have a cheese plate. For me, a small glass of this would be absolutely everything I needed because the acidity is very light when you're full and you get that sweetness to satisfy the sweet tooth. To me, this is dessert in a glass. Like, Also, if you don't normally like blue cheese, I would honestly say while you have this bottle open, just push your boundaries even more and go get some blue cheese and pair it with this on a cracker and it like it will blow your mind like i if, if i'm wrong if if you still think that blue cheese is disgusting when pairing it with this i will give you uh 20 off your next purchase at wine cult you can hold me to it if you don't like it i am happy to give you that honestly like because it it will it changes the flavors are just like also okay. with like a creamy blue cheese it would be really good yes what about a vegan feta like a no go away vegan feta. <laughs> 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 sabrina <laughs> showed up for that he's last night we Raw didn't vegan invite feta. kathy what did what did you and the boys pair with the sweet wine with the late harvest 
I made the Hungarian shortbread, which I'm about to bring to the table. Ooh, we look forward to hearing. And I put apricot in it because I couldn't find a quince paste. Good call. Well, it's kind of, a really good friend of mine has a tree. She lives in Seattle. If she lived closer, I would have asked to borrow because she, her tree produces a lot. So she tends to have stuff year long. She'll freeze paste. She'll make paste out of it. So, so is the, the are those, are those like hamantashen, the shortbread with apricot? Uh, no, the recipe called for like a, an interesting shortbread recipe that added egg yolk to the recipe and then you froze it for about 45 minutes, then you grated it. Oh. Like you grated the, it's, I know it sounds weird, right? That's weird. <laughs> you grated the frozen dough. Um, so anyway, we haven't cut into it yet, but we'll see how it goes. Marcy, it looks kind of like, um, kind of like a really thin version of a, like a crumble. Crumble. Oh, okay. And you know, it's really interesting. I think I can see why quince would work, but because I get so many apricot notes on the palate, I think with apricot jam or, you know, even a fresh apricot, it would, it would be a perfect pairing. Indeed, ginger. Ooh. Ooh. Look, Gina. Oh, sorry. I was taking a picture of the wine. <laughs> show Kathy, show your, show it one more time. Oh my God, it's beautiful. Send me another piece when we cut into it. Yes, bitch. Oh, we need plates. <laughs> oh, I love it. So yeah, so just seeing the diversity, you just see that a sweet wine. And now think about spicy food. Mm -hmm. And what this will do with spicy food is the sweetness will cut it down. So if you're really sensitive to spice, um, you really don't want to ever drink a dry wine with spicy food, but you get something with sweetness and it will cut that, that heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a read Szechuan a lot and the spicier, the better my kids are addicted to it as am I. And we always go for like kind of bolder sort of Rieslings, but this might work. And whenever we try to stray and we're like, well, maybe like a, like a Chardonnay. Yeah. It's too, it's not, it's not right. It, sometimes it can almost work, but like if it was a California Chardonnay, but why bother? Riesling and then something like this would be ready-made for it. However, this one with it, no, no chance. That would not work. I was gonna say next time, try Torontes. Ah. Yeah, that's, that's a great call. You're looking ahead, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or like a Zarello maybe? I think we've tried Albarino. Yeah, I've done that. But it's not, Albarino is not, it's different. Albarino, you kind of lose, so if it's the wrong wine, you lose the character of the wine. With Riesling, yeah. it tends to accentuate the Rieslingness of it. Sometimes it can almost, I don't uh, want to say water down, but just kind of make a Albarino kind of even, where I like yeah. Toronto's with Yeah, this. yeah. Toronto's is very high acid. So that's that could work with like the meat heavier sort of dishes. All right, I'm dying to hear how the shortbread goes. <laughs> what do you I also want to. Um, so I was going to say, what do you think for the like a sauterne versus a tokai? Like, I think I think you're in the same. I think you're in the same family with those. Getting a sauterne, um, I, I think these are exactly in the same place. And I, I would say that a sauterne is going to be richer than this late harvest. Um, it'll be more like a one or two petunios tokai. But it's that same idea, like, you know, am I in the mood for Saturn or am I in the mood for Takai? I don't know. But I think they, they fit the same. They're the choice you would make. Just like if you were deciding, you know, am I in the mood for um, Gamay or Pinot Noir tonight? I mean, you know, when you're in the same sort of realm of category, you're saying, yeah, let's go a little here, a little there. Or what's available on a list, you know, it's like... Yeah, but what's yeah. the better value? Soft turn just because of the name can sometimes, although Tokai as well can be crazy priced. So it kind of depends. So There's maybe a wash on the price on the value range, right? Yeah. I saw some some shortbread float across Kathy's screen. Yeah. We're Bring watching Kathy take bites. We want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, Paul, guys. Let us know, how is it? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> more wine for you. <laughs> Um, Kim and Eddie shouted out in the chat grapefruit, and I'm assuming that's a tasting note for this wine. And Eddie did good Eddie call. Did. Yeah. This is yeah. I've been I've been doing. I, it, was I don't know. More, it was more to the scent. We were trying to figure out what we smelled. I don't know how many I've done, and this is the first time I've ever gotten a like a legit tasting or a scent note. So <laughs> quite, I was quite proud of it. So. Yay. Well we're learning. Done. We're learning. It's really pretty. It's got all those tropical fruitness. I'm now picking up even some like white flowers. You know, like the the flowers, like uh, what are they? You know, the Hawaiian flowers, the really aromatic. Is it oh, jazz? Like the guava <laughs> and the like apricot <laughs> sounded very good, but I was like, yeah. was, like there's something um, else, and we were like trying to figure out what it was. Yeah, definitely pink or white grapefruit like on the nose heavily. It's really floral as well. It, it smells like you're walking into a flower garden in Oahu or something, it's beautiful. Yeah. Not so much now, but when I first opened it, I got like the aromatics of like neroli, you know, so like a nice citrus blossom. And honey. I'm really enjoying the like whole mouth oh. experience. Oh, no, someone Sorry, else. Get, get that jumped on, what do you? <laughs> I know. She never shows her face. <laughs> I just wanted Gina to know that my husband, Darren, hates blue cheese and he begrudgingly said, it's okay. Woo! I take it. That's so, amazing. It's the pairing. Well, really, like, it's like this gorgeous <laughs> gold juice that makes blue cheese better. Well, I mean, it, it really, really is a an interesting thing because I've been up here, I've been traveling now for a week and um, up in Northern California and, um, you know, interviewing winemakers for my podcast. And I always ask them a question about food and wine pairing. And it's just always an interesting thing when you really think about how to approach it. I mean, first of all, you should always try everything because you never know what a sweet wine could work with something you didn't expect or you just never know until you try. And you know, winemakers are in a better position because they usually have a lot of open wines and they're not, wor they're, not, they're not worried about opening a ton of wines. Unlike us normal consumers who are like, this is the wine I picked tonight. If it doesn't work, damn it, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, it is kind of, it is one of those things that so many times we can say we don't like a wine or we don't like a food, but when you put them together, it changes everything. And, you know, that's when you can say at the end, like, you know, it's not my preference to, okay, I'll say it's not my preference typically to drink Cabernets. That's not my jam. I'm, I'm a little more on the other side, but let's face it. When I have a really good Bordeaux blend with a nice piece of meat, I understand why it's so good. <laughs> so. And the blue cheese reduction on it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So there you go. I was going to say, that, what? We're done? Yeah, wine converts. Oh. <laughs> I thought we're, I thought you said we're over. And I was like, wait, no. <laughs> um, I was going to say that I really appreciate this style of wine because it, we talk about mouthfeel with every wine. Of course, every wine has its own unique, you know, experience with mouthfeel, but this specifically I mean, you get the acid, which always kind of attacks this part. You start drooling, but then like, sorry if this is gross, but like the, the drool mixed with the like sweet luscious wine in your mouth. Like it's just, it's such, <laughs> it's such an experience. It's so good. And um, yeah, I'm really happy. This is, was like the perfect way to, to finish the series, a sweet finish. You were right, that did sound gross. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a professional, but I never said I was classy. <laughs> that is said nowhere on my website. <laughs> so, Gina, you want to tease them with what we got next, even though they all kind of know already? Yeah, so we talked about this at the end of our last tasting, um, but we are, we've, we haven't finalized anything, but we've definitely reached out. We have an idea of the wines that we're going to be featuring in our upcoming tastings. And we also have some uh, tentative dates. I say tentative only because I'm just scared that for some reason we won't be able to get a wine, but <clears throat> 
throw these on your calendar. Of course, I will send you an email officially inviting you when we um, have everything locked down. But we are going to slot in our comparative Pinot Noir tasting, which was heavily requested by all of you last time. We're aiming for that on June 11th. So save the date on that. Um, it's not going to be a blind tasting, but we are going to be discussing specific regions. Um, the last time Allison and I chatted what we think, because of course, like regionally specific Pinot Noirs are, can be very pricey. We want to make this approachable for everyone. Um, it's going to be, my Google sheet just signed me out. Uh, Willamette Valley, Russian River Valley in Sonoma, and Santa Rita Hills in Santa Barbara. Yes. And the fourth we wanted was Burgundy, which we found an affordable Burgundy, but it still was gonna take the price up. Yeah, so what we'll probably end up doing is creating just the, the New World um, regionally specific Pinots and create those as a bundle and then do an optional Bur Burgundy add-on, um, which of course, if you wanna do all of them, then that's fantastic. And we will in, the in that tasting we will talk about the burgundy, but we won't do as heavy as a deep dive, but we do want to make that purchase worthwhile. So we'll, we do always like to give context to these new world wines with the old world wines. So we wanted to make it affordable and approachable, but also just in case you wanted the whole package and the whole experience, we'll make that available for you guys. And then um, we are also going to, we also have plans to um, launch our South America and um, Central America tasting. And that's gonna be Chile, Argentina, Mexico. And like we mentioned last time, a Uruguayan and Brazilian uh, sparkling wine. So, or Uruguayan to not with a uh, Brazilian sparkling wine. And um, so we're planning on that. I still have to get confirmation from some of the importers that's our plan, but the date for that, and I'm, I'm is gonna, um, thank you, Allison. <laughs> the first one would be June twenty fifth. Yes. Then July 9th, July twenty third, and then if we do the fourth one, it would be August sixth. Yeah. So spaced out every two weeks, like we've been doing, um, and so we still have to figure out the pricing. But I don't. I think it's going to be probably the exact same pricing as we did for this bundle. Um, so. Y'all are familiar with that. And if you're interested in joining, we will send you all invites. Um, and you guys, you guys know the drill. We're here to bring you some cool, crazy wines and uh, talk a lot about them. So we hope you join us then. Thank you for being part of all five of these. This was really fun. And it was really great to see the same faces each time to kind of have the familiarity of what we had done before and a context of the whole thing. and. You know, not that you couldn't have done these as standalones, but it was really nice to to be with people who kind of understood like, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> I yeah. know. It. I agree. I, what an incredible group it's been. This has been so fun, so, fun, so educational and good wine, too. So it's been excellent. Really enjoyed it. And these I, wines have been fabulous. Cool. Thank you. We hope that even with vaccinations and even with starting to go out in the world safely, hopefully still with a mask because that's the most ludicrous thing to say, <laughs> don't wear a mask if you're vaccinated and every loser out there who hasn't vaccinated doesn't have a V tattooed. If I could tattoo a V on me, then I would go out in public without a mask on. Until then, I'm wearing my mask. Instead of V for uh, vendetta. <laughs> I very much appreciated a friend pointing out like, how am I supposed to go out with a, out a mask and tell my children they still have to wear masks because they're too young to get a vaccine. <laughs> I mean, I happen to be with people. This was planned when we all knew we'd be vaccinated traveling together. But every winery we've walked into, we've had a mask on. And the first thing is, I'm vaccinated. Are you? And they say yes. And we say, OK, do you mind? And we take them off. But the servers still pour our wine with masks on and the, at the restaurants and at the wineries. And everyone still is you know, doing that. And I'm just like, that's how it should be. I, I took my kids to the museum today and the museum was like, we don't care your status. You all wear masks. And I was like, thank you. I think it's going to be like that for a while and I'm okay with it. Yeah. So 
Anyway, I was going to say that even if you're going to start going out more, hopefully Friday nights, you don't want to be like those people who only go out on Friday night. You want to make Friday night your night home. Yeah. It's the end of the week. You're tired. Exactly. <laughs> so. Um, last order of business for me, and then of course we can chat as long as we want. Um, I will be sending out an email. I've got a couple bottles left of the of most, not all of these wines. Um, I have some tabs going for a couple of you on, you know, as, as we've been going along, a couple of people have been saying, me too, me too. Um, you're welcome to email me and I can bundle all of them to you and, and ship them to you. So of course, I mean, I won't be shipping multiple, you know, two bottle orders here and there because that's silly. Um, but yeah, so I will send a follow-up email with whatever I have left in stock in case you want it. Um, in terms of this evening, the wines, I literally were sold out of the dry ferment and I have one bottle of the, um, of the, the sweet Tokai. So if you want it, throw it in the chat now, because that saves me a lot of time and effort sticking it in my shop, <laughs> um, or you can email it to me, but I will not include that in my shop, but I just wanted to let you know, because I have one or else I'll drink it. I'm okay with that. Or my sister will. <laughs> She's looking at me like, don't sell that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you guys, this was great. Thank you so much. This was five weeks or 10 weeks total of the time frame that we did this all together. This was really cool. Um, well, any last questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. I just I just want to share that William, who does not like blue cheese, we forced him to eat a piece of blue cheese with the dessert wine. And it was tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> but that's make, progress. Yes, but it, did it make the blue cheese taste better? No. <laughs> Felt appropriate? <laughs> But, but you know, didn't tolerate blue cheese at all. No, you? I would not. So it did make it more tolerable. It was edible. <laughs> so we went, from, we went from zero tolerance to edible. We we'll went it. from inedible to editable, so edible. So that, I mean, that's progress. Yeah, you were in the right direction. <laughs> William, we're, we're really we're the proud wrong of direction. And we tried it with both the so in, like I said, I made the shortbread but with an apricot jam instead of spread instead of the quince. And we also tried it with the blue cheese. Different experiences, but both really great. Mm -hmm. We prefer the apricot shortbread. That's us. So that was I just wanted to share that little I, would, I, I, I can understand that. And I would say that um yeah, I mean different experiences, right? I mean it works with both. You might prefer one, but. Allison, what you meant to say is obviously William has taste. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you know, if you think about it, it works with either one and you can have a preference, but you would never put the dry ferment with either of those. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't enjoy, I mean, you could, but it wouldn't be as an, it wouldn't be an experience. It would be just like, here's my wine and here's my food. And I don't think it would taste very good with blue cheese, to be honest. I think the, the minerality and the blue cheese would be weird together. I have a question for the group. Was there any, um, what was your favorite country that we visited? Was there any memorable wine or any, uh, so we did, I'm gonna work backwards, Hungary, Georgia, Armenia, Slovenia. Croatia. Croatia. Did anyone have a favorite? I think for me, the one that like stuck out as like a surprise, like, oh my God, I like, I will drink this forever was the red wine that we had from Armenia. Are you ready? Mm. Oh, I really like that one though. Mm -hmm. The Picasso Rebula was that for me. That was the Slovenian white. <laughs> I ended up putting it in my wine club to feature it and um, mistakenly <laughs> sold out of it. And I was like, crap, now I need more for me because I didn't get any. And it's just like, I have dreams of it. Like, it's just so good that that's, that's my palate. I think I, all the whites were, I mean, all the wines were fantastic and such a great introduction to all of the countries and, but, and they were all outstanding, but the whites 
were really well balanced. I mean, same with the Reds. It's, they were all really, you guys did a fantastic job of choosing and selecting and educating. And it's been a phenomenal experience. I've really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> we, we are struggling to remember because we were out of town for most of this, but we're both leaning towards Croatia. I think we liked Croatia. Although I really liked both of these too. We sold out of, I think all of the Croatian wines as well. That was a popular one for sure. I think I probably know the better of whatever I ordered extra, but. Well, I still have a couple post ship. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We'll come to your house, Brina. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, so many great wines. I don't know if I could pick a favorite. I like them all. Uh, I'm with Gina. It was the Slovenian. The that was that was good. That was the one you said, right? Yeah, yeah. That was, the that. Yes. But I, tra I, I traveled with some wine up here to Northern California because I had to bring the wines up here, knowing I was going to do the virtual tastings, and I had a virtual tasting last night as well. And I had room, so I threw in that Pet Nat Blau Frankish, which I'm going to go drink mm. now. Nice, good call. I'm gonna go try that. So we so for anyone, we didn't actually get that. That was um we had an, an emergent last case scenario with the Blau Frankish that we did for that was Slovenia, right? Yeah. 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 Um, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so we thought that we had, had everything ordered and placed on hold for this tasting. And then the distributor came back and said, just right before we were about to order, we have, you have the last case in existence of this wine. And of course we sold out of it. And the, the next plan was if anyone wanted to purchase more, we would throw in a pet nut, um, which is fantastic, which I am planning on bringing into my shop. I haven't done so yet, um, but you'll all get a notification when we do, but that's, that's the one and it's it's fantastic. So stay tuned. All right, guys. We will give you your Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much for these tasting. Thank, Thank you guys for joining us. Hope to see you at the next one. Yes. We'll see you very soon. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy your next couple of weeks and we'll talk to you soon. Thank Great. you. Bye. <laughs>